Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, White Supremacy, Post-Truth, and the Failure of Imagination, an Intercultural Praxis Approach with Catherine Sorrells. My name is Vicki Velasquez, and I'm the product marketer here at Sage Publishing. So let me begin by introducing you to our speaker today. Catherine Sorrells is a professor of communication studies at California State University, Northridge. She combines critical cultural studies and post-colonial perspectives to explore issues of culture, race, gender, class, and sexuality. The critical social justice approach she uses to study and practice intercultural communication is informed by her experiences growing up in the South during the tumultuous and transformative civil rights movement and her subsequent participation in the anti-war women's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender and labor and immigrant rights movements. Catherine has published a variety of articles related to intercultural communication, globalization, and social justice. Additionally, Catherine has experience as a consultant and trainer for nonprofit, profit, and educational organizations in the areas of intercultural communication and multicultural learning. This one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and to all registrants in the coming weeks. If any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use your Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A from attendees, so also please use that Q&A box to ask any questions to the speaker throughout the webinar. You can also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag Sage Talks, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there too. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Professor Sorrells. Good morning or good afternoon or evening, uh, or it might be the middle of the night. I know there's people joining from around the world, wherever you are, welcome to you. I think amid uh, our COVID pandemic, with all the challenges, the losses, the sorrow, and all of these things, one of the encouraging things is that people are being innovative and innovative using technology like this to bring people together. And I, I just want to recognize that, that um, in a way it does even challenge the way that so many things are commodified and the, the ways that we are recovering a public commons to some extent. Uh, so, of course, we have to recognize the privilege that that uh, entails, that we're able to join through a, web, a webinar like this and we have access to the Internet. Uh, but I just wanted to start out and thank everyone for being here from wherever you are joining to thank Lily Norton and Vicki Velasquez from SAGE uh, for supporting this webinar. I'm going to turn off my camera now and move forward, and then at the end when we come back with Q&A, uh, we'll bring the camera back. So I wanted to ground us a little bit, um, and when I say that, partly what I'm looking at is uh, understanding a little bit more uh, about where we are located and doing a land acknowledgement. Somehow my, I'm not getting access to the PowerPoint, uh, but doing a land acknowledgement uh, and situating ourselves, the land, the people, the culture. And for myself, I am in the Los Angeles area. So I wanna recognize that, that I am on and my campus is on the Tatavian people's land. And those folks along with the Tongva and the Chumash are the oldest inhabitants of the land that we now call the San Fernando Valley. It's important to acknowledge the conquest, the genocide, the survival to this day of indigenous peoples of this land. And we're here to celebrate and join with the resourcefulness and the determination and sustainability of Native peoples. So uh, uh, 
I need to, Vicki, I'm not able to um, move forward. There we go. Um, so I want to also recognize that you think about it. Where are you situated? Where is your university, university situated? Part of this exercise here is to, to show respect for the past, the present, and the future of indigenous peoples. It's also to, to recognize the relationship between people and land, the struggles, the resilience, and to also combat the erasure that's happened historically and continues today. I want to make an important point here, though. It's also about action. It's about building alliances with people who are indigenous to the land. So on your campus, can you build connections? Can you understand the history? Can you strengthen those intercultural connectedness, that intercultural connectedness? So um, what is our intention for today? Our intention for today is to get, gain perspectives and strategies to address complex sets of issues that are confronting us. In this case, we're looking at white supremacy, the so-called post-truth era we're living in, and failures of imagination. And looking at how can we do that in our classrooms, in our community, and in our nation. So we live in interesting times. You may have heard this slogan or this phrase before, may you live in interesting times. And it's often considered, is this a curse? Is this a blessing? Is this a prophecy? Is this apocryphal? This is claimed, this particular statement or this, this phrase is claimed to be of Chinese origin. However, there's really no evidence that it comes from China. It was posited as being a Chinese curse by people in the West. So I think it's an interesting thing to start our, our conversation out with, which is questioning even the way we talk about the times we're living is in. Is this already a, an intercultural uh, uh, statement that's lost in tra translation? Is this a misrepresentation? So rather interestingly, Robert Kennedy used it in 1966 uh, in a speech that's known as the uh, the Ripple of Hope that he gave in Cape Town, South Af Africa to students. I think it's interesting it will connect into our framing for today of this conversation. So let's get right to it. What is going on? How can we make sense of what is happening in the world today? The first three Wednesdays, as you might recall, in January, there was an insurrection there was an impeachment and there was an inauguration. So I'm curious, the poll is in progress, is just to respond to this, is how surprised were you that the insurrection occurred? So the question is, there was a storming of the Capitol by white supremacists. Then there was a denial and a gaslighting misinformation was put out about it, that this was actually Antifa. Uh, how could this have happened? This is not who we are, right? So interestingly, about half of you are not surprised. 30% are saying a little, somewhat, very surprised. I think that this may be, think about it as we go through, that the, even our response to this question may relate to our positioning, our understanding of history, and our framing of current events. So there, we'll get into this in a lot more detail, but I wanted to just get that set up going um, about really what the context is for the talk. So may you live in interesting times. The current context, I'm proposing to you, and it's really not mine, it's Pinel Joseph, who's a historian, uh, Dr. Reverend William Barber, uh, uh, Kindy talks about this in his book uh, in 2016. So is that we're living in the third reconstruction, the period of the third reconstruction. And I think it's a useful framework to situate where we are right now historically, to look at the lessons from the past. Uh, Joseph, Dr. Joseph says that history doesn't really repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So let's just take a quick look at the first 
and second reconstructions. Okay, so the first reconstruction, end of the Civil War, it's a moment of possibility. It's a moment of possibility for Black people specifically. It was all too short from 1865 to 1877. So it was a short moment, but this is when the passage of the 13th Amendment happened, the 14th Amendment happened, the 15th Amendment. So this is the ending of slavery, the giving, the uh, actually acknowledging of citizenship and the right to vote for men, of course, for black men only, not women. So it was a fundamental challenge to white supremacy, the foundation upon which this country had been built, briefly, because there's a backlash. So very quickly, white people in power, white people generally actively worked against democracy and actively worked for white supremacy. And at that time, there were what we might call today fake news, big lies about Black people, that Black people are inferior, misrepresentations, uh, disinformation, the big lie that there was fake history, that the Reconstruction period was an assault on white people, that it threatened white womanhood, that it actually was a betrayal of democratic values. And then we know in the aftermath, there's the Jim Crow era, the reign of terror, the lynching, the criminalization of black people and the criminalization of them to create unpaid and low paid labor in a way that was very similar to slavery. Attack on black rights, on black voting rights. I hope there's some echoes going on here for you. The reimagining of racial terror as patriotic, if you are familiar with the birth of a nation. So the failures of imagination of white people in particular to imagine a true multicultural democracy. Of course, there's the issue of gender inclusivity um, and so that white supremacy and patriarchy would be threatened by this. So then the second reconstruction, the second reconstruction during the civil rights movement and Dr. Joseph and others might kind of point to the 19 forwards, forward to the late 1960s. This is a big challenge again to white supremacy. The end of segregated Jim, uh, the segregated uh, uh, laws of the of Jim Crow, the passing of the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. Massive resistance, though, emerges. Massive resistance to racial justice. Now, I want to acknowledge there was multicultural interracial alliance building during the second, uh, uh, during the civil rights movement, during Reconstruction. Certainly there was. Uh, and there was visionary leadership among both black and white groups of people. However, there was a massive kind of uh, pulling back and resistance to racial, racial justice by the majority of white people. There were big lies again, misrepresentation that, that addressed, oh, this must mean that racism is over. Even as the Southern strategy was being put in place and not of course only in the South. The consciousness of many people was shifted, arguably. Certainly the consciousness was shifted, yet there was a failure of imagination, white people's failure to challenge the rhetoric of dehumanization, failure to treat black lives as human lives. So this idea that the threat to black lives is, is also a threat to all of our lives. So we're living in interesting times. Here we are in the third reconstruction. So this is a way to think about it, the third reconstruction period. And many people would argue it started with the election of Obama, with hope, with this idea, if you all remember, oh, we're in a post-race era. And yet, almost immediately, we have this emergence of white grievance. And this question of how do people of color get ahead of white people? The Tea Party, with the election of Trump. And people ask the question, is this an aberration? Is this a continuation of American life? Is this part of the reconstruction? Are we in the aftermath? 
So there was this is, and I would say it's not was, or continues to be this quest to redeem whiteness and white privilege, male privilege, and to make, as we know, the slogan, make America great again. And yet there's resistance on the justice side for inclusion of all peoples and the emergence and the strong presence of Black Lives Matter movement and the uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial movements for economic and racial justice and the call for massive re redistribution um, of wealth. So these things are competing with each other, the backlash, the resistance, and the resistance to those. So there's also fake news, right? Big lies that are happening. This isn't America. We heard this. This isn't who we are. And I think the point here is to say, yes, it is who we are. Acknowledge it, recognize it, be aware of how we're framing things, how we're positioned in relation to the current times and the past. That we fixed race, the race problem, that there's no issues with voting rights, that there's not a problem with police brutality, and that America is exceptional, the exceptionalism. Uh, that there's no such thing, I know you all heard these things from folks, there's no such thing as white supremacy. Insurrection didn't happen. Uh, it was actually Antifa. That voter fraud now was why the uh, previous president was voted out, that it was actually fraud based. So huge failures of imagination that the insurrection could happen that it would be predominantly white people, that a mob that was violent, people in this country typically didn't see things this way. And it's a failure to imagine. If it had been Black Lives Matter protesters, people would have been right on top of it. So this is the cultural imagination that needs to be challenged. So, Let's shift here and think a little bit. That was kind of quick over you. What did we do to make this situation clearer to shed light on it? What did we do? I think one of the things is asking questions, inquiring, uh, and trying to make sense of what is going on by trying to see it from multiple perspectives. So the process of framing and reframing, reorienting, contextualizing, contextualizing within a historic context, understanding the relationship between time periods, uh, and then also beginning to uh, move into the notion of positioning and situating within a broader context. So contextualizing the issues within relationships of power, highlighting the power relations that have happened over time. These are critical ways of making sense of what's happened today is to be able to see what's been going on historically. And then finally, in this very beginning section here, it's about dialoguing. And of course, I was dialoguing, but I'm dialoguing between what time periods, among different points of view and different frames, and different discourses and different rhetoric. So it's beginning to see how these multiplicity of voices, perspectives, points of view have come together, colliding. Which ones get favor? Which ones are believed? Which ones are seen as true? So this is all a way to kind of prepare us, and we'll shift to the next slide, uh, which is about the intercultural praxis model. So this model is a way of engaging in challenging complex issues. You can use it on your own, by yourself. You can use it in a pair. You can use it with a group. You can use it in your classroom. It has been used to reconsider curriculum and how to make curriculum more uh, inclusive and anti-racist. So the purpose of the model is to kind of take us through a variety of steps. They're really what I call points of entry or ports of entry into a praxis. Praxis is coming from uh, Freire's notion, Paulo Freire's notion of reflection and action. Reflection and action. So it's a way to navigate the complexities, to raise our awareness, increase our understanding of, of where we are, who we are, what the issues are, but then move next to action. 
what do we do with this? If we're not going to get paralyzed just in the analysis. We're saying, what can we do? What do we need to do? So um, we could take the topic of white supremacy as a subject. There's any numbers. I wouldn't recommend starting with that in your class the first day, but over time is to look at. So if we're talking about inquiry, what do we know about white supremacy? How does e how do each of us understand it? What what do we not know? It's as important as what we do know. What do we need to learn about it? In the inquiry section, I'm really trying to encourage people to understand that they don't know everything. Our knowledge is partial, that we have to be flexible and we have to be willing to be changed. If you have people from different backgrounds, and you will in your classes of whether that's based on gender, whether that's based on class, whether that's based on racial uh, background, if it's made uh, based on uh, documentation status, nationality, how are people framing their understanding of white supremacy based on their culture, their experience, their background, their understanding, all the people that have come together? So framing is beginning to see how we're both limited by what because of our cultures our intersectional cultures but then how can we open those frames by engaging with others hearing different points of view framing also sort of refers to moving back and forth during time periods uh, and and it can be spatial as we might do with a, a google maps for example zeroing in or moving back out positionality is about our relationship with power so in terms of white supremacy how would uh, people who are in uh, are white and understood as white and experience themselves as white and identify as white and are seen as white in this culture how is their understanding of white supremacy perhaps different than people of color in this country how might their perspectives because they are positioned differently in terms of socially constructed categories like race, gender, class, nationality, religion, uh, language, documentation, all of these things, we're all positioned differently in relation to ourselves and others in the world, right? How does our positionality teach us to see, make sense of the world differently? And it all positionality also it pushes us to think who's not being heard here who's being silenced so dialogue is important too dialogue is about the engagement between different points of view different perspective it doesn't mean you agree but it means you listen you hear you try to understand reflection not something that we do deeply in well in this country but trying to encourage people to reflect to learn from the past so that we may move forward towards effective action so this is informed action informed action that actually creates access that creates possibilities that challenges systems that are inherently built to exclude so how are we participating in either upholding those or how are we leveraging our positionality our identities our framing our ways of asking questions to challenge and change and to create access openness more equitable uh, and just world so that gives you an idea of the model we're going to kind of shift um, moving forward here towards um, understanding a little bit more about uh, uh, white supremacy. You know, and the poll here is how prepared are you to teach about white supremacy? If you can just respond to that. I think it's a challenging topic and it's understood very differently by different people. Uh, it's threatening. A lot of people feel very fearful of even addressing the topic of white supremacy uh, and there's a sense that people are not as prepared so people are saying prepared somewhat prepared somehow underprepared yes so that's across the board and what i would say is wherever you are i encourage you to do the work to become more prepared i've been working on this for 30 40 you know we could even argue longer years uh on on whiteness and white supremacy and on my own self in my own participation in it so it takes time but you have to really commit to educating yourself so in the classroom you know i think it's a perfect place so this becomes the project or one of the projects in your classroom 
it becomes one of the projects in the classroom, which is to really say, how can we become actively anti-racist? I've included a number of uh, sources here. There's many more, but it's not just about saying I'm not racist. It's about saying, how can we be actively anti-racist? So in my experience, it's not my job as the faculty member, the professor, the teacher, the trainer, to tell people how to do this. We have to go through a process of understanding why it's important to do it and then collectively work on how to be effective at doing it. So the classroom becomes more of a laboratory than somehow a, from the banking model of education that I as the expert will teach you how to do it. No, it's how do we engage with each other and I find students working together and them holding each other accountable, of course, with your facilitation, with your guidance is the most effective way. So in the, and I want to mention here, it's not just about being anti-racist, it's, it's how can we do this in an intersectional way. So we're addressing issues of gender, sexual orientation, nationality, documentation status, and these types of things. So the work is important to do. It's, it's emotional work, it's cognitive academic work, and then it's behavioral work. How do I actually do this? How do I intervene? How do I say to my friend who has just made a racist comment that that makes me feel uncomfortable? Can we talk about not speaking that way? Or to my group of, if you are a man, male friends who makes a sexist comment. So it's not just about uh, knowing it in your head, it's actually engaging with it in the body. So I also then, you know, shifting on a, a little bit is looking at the, uh, how this idea of the post-truth world we live in, and I put it in quotes because I think it's really important we use the classroom to talk about how can we discern facts from interpretations? How is truth related to power, the so-called truth that we believe in? So uh, at, by way of example, the events that happened on January 6th, you know, at the beginning of the media cast, they were being called rioters. And then at over time, they were called insurrectionists. So you might inquire in your class, what's the difference between a rioter and an insurrectionist? Then later people called them, some people uh, from some points of view called them patriots. So what does that mean that somebody who is an insurrectionist is also being called a patriot? Some people are calling them extremists. What does that mean? Now, visually being able to say, and from everything we've read, the facts are these were pro-Trump supporters. Facts are facts. Then how do we interpret them is different. So multiple perspectives, positionality, framing, our understanding of history, our understanding and experience of them will come into play. So, but it's very important for me. It's not just to say, oh, this is this is what happened. There are multiple interpretations of what happened. There are facts that we can uh, should be able to agree on that did happen. Then there are interpretations. When there's interpretations, though, I'm very keen on asking the question, who benefits? from me and other people believing this? Who will benefit? Whose point of view, whose perspective, whose ideology, whose um, actual resources are uplifted by us believing this? The last thing I'll just say about this is just trying to push people to both and, not that it's either or. Uh, again, I'm not trying to say that, that things that are actually didn't happen or are untrue should be acknowledged and given uh, the time or the light, but I'm saying multiple interpretations of things do exist. So the, if we can shift on now, it's just also important to me to sort of think about as the facilitator, the teacher, what is our approach? In the, in the intercultural practice model, the teaching and engaging students, we're engaging them in a process. 
this and and this is one reason I actually like working in the classroom because we have 10 weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks to kind of engage students in a process. You as the facilitator need to model the process. You have to model it and see that it's relational. You're trying to build relationships, encourage them to build relationships with each other. It's not a transaction, it's relational. Ask questions, ask questions. Your job is to frame and reframe. How can we think about this differently? How would it be understood by people who are different from the group of us who are here in this room right now? Um, and address your own positionality, how that impacts. Acknowledge your privileges and how it impacts your frames, how you need other people to expand your frame, to expand your understanding of uh, what's happening. I think this activates our, our humility. We become more humble in the process. And our humility that we don't know everything, that we don't necessarily have all the right answers, that we need others is really important. So also identifying yourself and all of us as learners in the process, let go of needing to know I can actually tell you from you know 25, 30 years of experience in the classroom that the stories that emerge, the experiences and the testimonies, even as they may compete and conflict with each other, are some of the most powerful learning experiences in the classroom. So this process of engaging in intercultural praxis can be transformational. Uh, there's also, yeah, don't forget the both and uh, instead of the either or, but it also can be transformational. So um, just a, a last few things before we get uh, close it out here and, and end up with some questions is, is to kind of think through how it works in the classroom. So for me, I'm starting out and using this model from almost the very first week in my classes. So we don't spend a lot of time on it every session, but there is an uh, opportunity to model through engagement and this facilitated group work. So I try to integrate it into group and team projects so that they are actually practicing with the same set of people and then with new people, understanding the process of inquiry, asking questions, being willing to let go of what our preconceived notions are, understanding what our frames are, understanding who uh, we are in the process. So all of these things are important to engage and practice. I'm just giving you some other ideas for case studies. We went through the process around white supremacy. We looked a little bit around the idea of um, the post-truth society that we're, so we're living in, as well um, as the idea of the failure of imagination. But you could focus on COVID-19 uh, vaccinations. And who is getting them? Who is not getting them? How does this relate to even the disproportionate uh, numbers of people of color who have died from uh, the uh, from COVID um, vi from the COVID virus, from the disproportionate number of people of color who are essential workers. So drawing these things together, you could do it on the Oscars that's upcoming, on the women in sport. These are just some ideas. It could be about an anti-Semitic uh, camp uh, issue that happened on a campus. These are just ideas for you. So I'm just gonna uh, end here. The last slide um, is really a kind of bringing it to forward to action. So, and to me, action happens every day. Action happens when we intervene, uh, if it's a racist, sexist, homophobic remark. Uh, action happens when we make decisions about what news programs we watch. Action happens when we decide who, who we are friends with and connect with and spend time with. Action happens when we buy things and we, we, we put our money into um, certain, certain interests. So action is not uh, you know, something that you wait um, the whole semester and then make happen. It is happening throughout. So the, the, the question is, can we imagine alternatives? Can we imagine a world where racial, ec economic, gender, and all forms of justice are centered? What are our spheres 
of influence in the classroom? What are your spheres of influence? We can't change everything. This is true. Yes, 52%. Sometimes, not really. I understand all of those responses. I'm encouraged by the, the, the ability to imagine. And this is where it kind of it connects into the idea of, of our failures to imagine. What I'm trying to encourage you is to think, well, what do we want to create? And not just you, but you're asking this question to your classroom. So what do you all want to create? How can we reimagine an alternative? And it could, you could choose some simple issue on campus. Ask your students what concerns them, what bothers them. There's always a social justice aspect to it, even if it's about parking. Okay, so how can they reimagine an alternative? And they work towards that in uh, with the an awareness of your spheres of influence. You engage them in it. So I think uh, to a great extent, we need permission. And so I'm offering you permission. And I'd like to suggest that you offer your students permission to imagine another world. It's happening around us. So my last slide is just my uh, references, which I'm sure you'll get at some point. Um, so now I think we will open it up for questions. Thank you so much for your patience and for listening. Uh, and I will turn on my video. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that great presentation. And if you're interested, you can find out more about her, um, her book, Intercultural Communication, Globalization and Social Justice on the sagepub.com website. Um, I want to invite you all to ask questions too, to submit questions. Yes, yes, exactly. So now we will spend some time answering some of your questions. So again, please continue to send them in um, via that um, chat box on the right hand side of your screen. So the first question for you, Catherine, um, can you elaborate a bit more on the concept of positioning in the praxis model? Yeah, I think it's an actually an important, it's kind of the key, one of the main keys, and perhaps maybe the one that's least understood and most critical. But it's really about understanding um, how we are positioned, how we're placed within relationships of power. And the relations of, of power get structured differently in different parts of the world, perhaps even to some extent different parts of the country. But for example, in the United States, it's a we're deeply racialized country. So the landscape is very uh, uh, divided, yes, but also characterized by uh, our racial makeup. So that you are, we're stratified based on race. It's not just race, we're also stratified by gender. And then a huge thing is around class and how those intersect. So the idea of positioning is in any situation, uh, those issues that we might think of that make up our various identities, race, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, um, documentation status, all of those things, those combine with our institutional roles, for example, student versus professor, president of a university versus a faculty member, um, or at a corporation, those combine to position us uh, with a certain amount of power. The purpose of understanding that is to be aware that impacts our framing, how we make sense of the world. And it also impacts what we can do because, in fact, as we have increased power and privilege, we can have access to leveraging that to change and to alter the situation. So I hope that helps a little bit understanding positioning. Um, uh, yes. And we do have a few more questions. Okay. So. I have been teaching intercultural in this way for a long time. How do you push back on colleagues who only consider intercultural communication as international communication? Mm. 
You know, that is so such a great question. Um, and part of the challenge of it is it's historical, right? Because in the United States or in the scholarship, intercultural communication did start out as being primarily focused on international intercultural issues. However, by the 70s, 80s, the research and into the 90s, um, it's very clear that there's a focus also on U.S. domestic issues. So one of the things I would say to you is that um, this, these are kind of old paradigms. And so it's this idea, it's international or it's domestic. What I try to offer to people is that we need a new paradigm that is really more about relating the local with the global. So that we are not talking about, oh, these issues are only here in the United States or these issues are only here uh, in, in international settings, but they are related and interconnected. So I'm going to give an example here. So I did focus on white supremacy, but in my book and the latest edition of it, I'm actually focusing uh, more on ethno-nationalism. So white nationalism is part of that, but in India, in Turkey, in Russia, in various parts of the world, there's this rise of uh, religious and other ethnic nationalist interests and groups. So the idea that it's either, either international or domestic, I think is a paradigm that really doesn't help us. I understand that your colleagues feel that way. I would say invite them to see the connections between what's going on. So for example, when the protests happened uh, in Minneapolis and a, um, a, a, because of the George uh, Floyd uh, murder, the ripple effect was around the world. Palestinians in the territories were protesting police brutality uh, there. Around the world, we saw the, the protests against the uh, excessive use of force. So what I would suggest to your colleagues is to move into more of a global paradigm that looks at how the local and the global are connected and interrelated and not to focus on, oh, is it international or is it US based? Hope that helps. Great, thank you. Next question is, do you teach explicit conflict communication methods as you work with students? And is it in your textbook? You know, the textbook um, does go through uh, a fair amount of discussion about um, how to understand conflict. So, and what I do offer in the textbook is trying to understand conflict from a micro level. So, you know, let's just use an example I use in the textbook. If it's an interpersonal conflict between two students in a high school, and this is a high school I worked at, Grant High School here in Los Angeles, Armenian student and um, uh, a Latinx student, it, you know, are fighting. So the micro levels, they're fighting. What are they fighting about? At, pretty soon their groups are behind them and they're kind of yelling at each other and they're uh, dehumanizing each other. They're talking... So that's the micro level. If you move out to the meso level, it's like, well, who are these two groups of people and how are they coming together in this school? So I try to look at the group affiliation and the and over time, the history of when this particular group of um, Honduran, Mexican, um, Amer folks came to Central American and Mexican Americans came to the US. And when did the Armenians and Armenian Americans come and where did they come from? So that's the meso level. And then the macro level is the larger issues around politics, geopolitical issues, uh, things that are happening in the world, that the media, how that impacts how they make sense of each other. So there's very, there's a framework for doing an analysis. I have students pick a conflict themselves and do that analysis. That's the cognitive part. It's helpful, right? Because they get the idea that this is very complex and there's multi dimensions to it. That itself uh, in the textbook is there. In the classroom, we try to use a lot of different techniques uh, that will help us embody addressing conflict when it emerges. 
Um, and whoever is asking that question, we'll put my email up at the end. I'll be happy to share more. Uh, there's a lot of theater techniques that we use in the classroom to actually uh, address and step into diffusing a conflict. Great, thank you. The next question is, can you suggest strategies for the classroom in a highly diverse group of students? white, black, Latino, male, female, and perhaps many white students who don't believe in white privilege? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. Everybody, thank you for your questions. Um, yes, so the more diverse it is, the more challenging in, in many ways it is, and then the more rich in possibilities it is. But I think really critical things that uh, is about setting the groundwork for the engagement. So I do this with a kind of norm setting practices at the very beginning of my class, so during the first week. And it follows a number of engaging exercises where they've shared stories with each other. And then out of that, and I, again, I'm happy to share that with you, uh, whoever is asking, but it, from that we set up norms of engagement. And it's not me telling them what the norms are, it's coming from the group. And, and then we refine that over time. So, and we ask questions, are we actually uh, doing this in a way that follows the norms that we've come up with? And they shouldn't be long, they shouldn't be detailed, but they should be really clear about um, how we're gonna engage. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, is really setting them up for understanding that it, the issues around positionality and framing that, and I would, and. I use my life experience. I grew up, well, I was born in Michigan. Six years old, we moved to the South. This is in the midst of the civil rights movement. Uh, so I was young, but I was also aware that I was now in a very different place. And uh, through that experience, and then later living in different parts of the world, different parts of the country. So I would say, use your story of how you understand that the way you saw the world at certain points was framed by your background, the people you're interacting with, how that's expanded, how important it is to know other people. So for me, it's about my knowledge is partial. I've learned more about whiteness and white privilege from my colleagues and friends and partners of color than I have from any book. I've read a lot. I've studied a lot. I recommitted myself to understanding that, but it's when people call you out and challenge you. So I try to help them understand that being vulnerable, being open to learning from somebody who's different from you uh, is what, that's what this class is about. If you're in an intercultural class or that's the work we need to do. So I think it's inviting people to be willing to be vulnerable, to be conscious. So even in the, the model part around reflection. So I invite them like, you know, somebody said something to you and you tense up and pull away. Uh, think about it. Why did you tense up and pull away? You know, maybe you were offended maybe they actually hit on something that you didn't want to hear. Why didn't you want to hear it? What are you afraid of? So it's an internal dialogue and an internal conversation and an internal reframing, but you're inviting them to do that. I think there's also the challenge because, you know, for the students of color, this sense of, oh no, we're going to do this again. Now I have to be the teacher and I have to be the one that puts everything out there. And so you have to be very conscious of, how you're inviting people into a conversation of vulnerability and a conversation where people are willing to be changed. In certain cases, if it's not coming up from the people in the group, I will bring it up. So I'll put it up on the board. These are potential responses. Let's talk through where the person would be coming from. What do you think their positionality is? Why would they be framing it this way? what do you think how do they benefit from believing this point of view right so because you you don't necessarily have to have everybody in the class always personalizing it they can sometimes see it better when it's written out uh, so here's another example of what I, a technique that i use which is you know and i still use the film color of fear i know it's from the early 90s we laugh about the clothes we laugh about the 
the various gender performances and things, but the information in there, I ask my students every semester, if this is no longer useful, I will stop using it. They always tell me, and I live in Los Angeles and teach uh, at extremely diverse college, university here. So, but what I have them do is, instead of just talking about it right after, is I want them to write a paragraph in response to particularly issues around whiteness and white privilege, um, and what is their relationship to that? Who did they relate to in the, in the film? So, and it's a paragraph. They pass them all up to me, I shuffle them out, and I pass them back out to everybody. And so the class reads everybody's response. So it's not, I'm not reading mine, it's not me saying this, it's somebody else saying it. But we get out all the possible points of view, and then we talk about them. So it's not personalized, but people can actually feel more comfortable speaking their truth. Thank you. The next question is, can you elaborate more on the era of post-truth? Yeah, thank you. Um, the thing is, you know, it's been coming a long time. One of the interesting things um, by doing this research about the reconstruction is to realize that, you know, the misconceptions, misrepresentations, um, of course, that's longstanding. That is not new. We kind of imagine that we're living now in this particular, and it is more intense and it's intensified by media. And of course, it's intensified by algorithms that intensify the media. All of those things are very true. So I don't want to erase the fact that we are, uh, that there, the idea of what is true is being challenged. That is accurate. It is being challenged. We, the, what I'm trying to challenge is that most people really don't know what is true. <laughs> I think most people do know what certain facts are, but it serves their political, and when I say political, I don't mean just in the sense of, you know, the, the, the formal structures of politics, but it serves their power interests to ignore them. And it's become customary and it's become accepted to ignore the facts, elevated to a degree that was rather unbelievable during the Trump administration. But the fact is people generally, it's not that they don't know there are facts, it's that they want to dismiss and disallow any facts. So what I'm saying, we have an opportunity in the classroom, call the facts back in, recognize the facts. Now, are there multiple truths? Always, there's multiple interpretations that are impacted by your positionality and, and are some of them, and I'm not saying, oh, they're all equal, because they're not all equal. They are informed by structures of power. The, and so we need to actually investigate that. Why do we think this is true? How come it's been put into us so many times? So my idea is to sort of question uh, that we are have got now gone so far into a, a sphere where we cannot identify what is facts. I don't agree with that. I don't think it's accurate. I think it's giving up on our responsibility as educators, as journalists, as uh, you know, publishers, as you know, the people in the in the society who are willing to step up and say there are facts that need to be recognized. Hope that helps. Thank you. Next question is. I've had some students in my intercultural class express feelings of exhaustion around topics of white supremacy. What actions can we take when discussing white supremacy that avoid re-traumatizing students of color in the classroom? Yeah, yeah, great question. Well, I think, you know, one of the things is that you can actually bring in the perspectives of people of color uh, through the assignments, so what people are reading, through videos. So you're not depending on the students in the classroom, but in, in this case, the students of color in the classroom, but you're actually laying the groundwork first by bringing those voices present. So it's kind of, it's obviously, uh, it feels uh, reinforcing for a person of color to see that the person in charge of the class, the facilitator, the teacher, 
is capable and of picking and choosing and finding voices that represent their experience and that they don't have to always say it. So I think that's really an important way, one important way to do it. Um, I think that it's important to invite, to, to bring that up. This is traumatizing. We're not trying to re-traumatize people. And if we need moments to reflect, if we need moments to be silent, if we meet, so giving also people ways of engaging that are not having to be the center of attention and telling their stories, or that they don't have to do it publicly. So, but my experience is that if you give them that sort of permission not to always have to be on show to tell their story that in and if you are helping for that story to be told through other means that there will be a willingness over time to actually engage and to talk now it also really helps if the people in the classroom the other people the white students in particular are willing to listen and engage and do that in a in a way that's meaningful not necessarily that they want to agree with everything but meaningful and respectfully but I think you have to acknowledge it, bring it that this is, and I remember, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, there's a point in uh, classes where you can see that visibly. So I think also strategy is talking to students and helping them and supporting them, students of color who you can see this is happening with. So I would spend time before or after class or even in a group talking with uh, students of color and helping them understand that I'm not expecting them to be the educator. I'm not expecting to please share what you feel comfortable with, what you feel okay about, what you want to uh, to actually engage in. So it to me it's about like, okay, we're trying to create alliances. We're trying to create connections across groups in our classes. Because that's really the work, you know, at the last question, 50, over 50% said they can imagine another world. Another world depends on us doing something super subversive. This country has worked so hard to keep people from building friendships and connections and alliances across racial groups. So what we're trying to do is we're inviting people to have the courage and yes, the stamina, and yes, sometimes it's resilience to do that. While we also recognize who has been doing that burden, who has carried that responsibility, who has carried that burden, and uh, you know, absolutely disproportionately, it's been people of color and black people in particular in this country. Great, thank you, Catherine. And I do wanna try and get in this last question here. Have mm -hmm. you used individual assessments in this work to develop intercultural competence? And if so, which ones? Uh, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of them, um, but, I, and I sometimes I show them and talk about them, but I don't administer them as, you know, some kind of a, a, a diagnostic tool. So um, the, uh, Milton Bennett's DIE, uh, you know, has been used. Uh, there's all sorts of different challenges and problems with it. So I use it as a way to discuss some issues. Um, and there's a few others that I've used, but I tend to um, feel that it's more helpful to spend my time uh, with the students, um, you know, move, helping them understand themselves and each other through their stories and testimonies, and then learning strategies of accountability for themselves, which up to this point, I haven't found, uh, you know, particularly any kinds of tools that will do that other than the hard work of doing it in groups. Okay, great, Catherine. We did have one more question, but I know we're at time. Um, if you have anything really quick to say, someone's asking if you can give advice for teaching intercultural communication or diversity at a predominantly white university with minimum diversity. Yeah, I see that. Great question. Um, yes, so you're gonna you're going to need to start where people are, and if they're not very familiar with um, 
you know, or don't have a lot of interaction or the, the, the students are not uh, present um, and the, in the environment. Uh, so start with gender. I'm assuming that you have both men and women uh, or multiply identified people uh, in your classroom. Uh, start with religion. You know, I mean, in certain places in the country, the diversity that matters in that is whether you're Lutheran or Presbyterian. I'm kind of making that up, but you know what I mean. So there is, so um, find out what matters, what differences, and it could be about class, you know, which is not something people feel that comfortable in talking about, but perhaps more comfortable than they do. So you want to root it, ground it in people's experience. So the what is their experience of diversity? Um, and, you know, the fact is because it's been coded, diversity has been coded as race, which is a critical piece, as I've mentioned in, in this webinar, but it's not the only piece of diversity. There are all sorts of intersecting ways that our socially constructed categories of difference actually include us or exclude us, right? So figuring out what those are, that's the place to start. Right. Then once you've got some ideas of them understanding the emotional, the cognitive, the behavioral dynamics of, of hierarchies of difference is what I would call it, is you now have some idea of understanding that, whether it's around gender or religion or uh, socioeconomics, then you kind of you have to bring in the parallel around race. And you have to bring in the stories or you let them bring in what they do know and you build on that. And so what they do know may not be very accurate. And that's very typical. What they do know may not be very fact based. So you're leading them into sources and access points where they can learn about the experiences of people who are different from themselves. Great, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, like I said, in the coming weeks, uh, please be on the lookout for an email that will include a link to view the entire webinar recording. And thanks again, hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.